This is CBC Here and Now. Mixing politics and booze results in a firing. I really wasn't shocked or anything. Hydro wants your heat bill jacked by 23%. There is no regulatory principles upon which Hydro is basing their application. Obituary outrage, a website tries to profit without permission. And you are using our grief to make money. It was a snowy weekend for most of us, and there's more snow in the forecast tonight into tomorrow, but a warm up in the long range. The details are coming up. The former head of the Liquor Corporation is speaking out about being fired. The government turfed Steve Winter on Friday after 14 years at the NLC's helm. And the person who's replacing him is someone he fired just a month ago. Now that's raised concerns of government interference. Here and else, Peter Cowan explains. Friday, government fired Steve Winter as the head of the NLC. The finance minister has a list of grievances. He says Winter wasn't looking hard enough for cuts and that he wasn't eager to take on the NLC's new role with pot. And the minister wasn't pleased when Winter fired the chief financial officer just last month. I was surprised at that. I was very disappointed uh, to learn of it and, and even more disappointed in, in how I learned of her dismissal. Uh, I contacted the Newfoundland Liquor Corporation uh, to talk about an agenda item that was on uh, one of our uh, internal audit committee meetings, and I was advised she was no longer an employee of the corporation. But now Winter is the one who's gone, and the former CFO, Sharon Sparks, well, she's hired back and promoted. She's now the interim CEO. Her old position is one that Winter decided the corporation could do without to save some money. But government decided otherwise and told the board to fill the position using former Liberal candidate Lynn Sullivan. That to me is just uh, unheard of. And then, you know, now to have a, a terminated executive put back in in my place, that just tells you that there's all kinds of governance issues and uh, or either that or there was an overall plan in the first place to do it. The opposition agrees that the minister shouldn't be meddling. The agencies, boards and commissions are designed to be, are supposed to be hands off from direct contact with ministers or with the cabinet or cabinet ministers. And this is, flies in the face of that. Here we have a circumstance now where a minister is now, gonna, is now making those very key decisions. The minister does have the power to pick a CEO and Osborne says Sparks will now be focused on finding savings. At a time when government needed more money, Winter did have a track record of delivering. During Winter's time as CEO, the payout to government grew dramatically, from $93 million when he took over to $183 million last year. Inflation over that time has risen 27%, but the payout has increased 96%. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Now, still with this story, Steve Winter tells the CBC he isn't shocked that he was fired, but he does have some concerns about his replacement. Winter sat down with Here and Now's Fred Hutton this afternoon. What was your reaction when you were told by the clerk? Well, it wasn't much of a reaction because I really wasn't shocked or anything. I mean, the fact that I was over there would have led me to believe that uh, <coughs> this was the day. Mm -hmm. Now, this comes a month after uh, Sharon Sparks was terminated from her position as CFO. Mm -hmm. You had brought that proposal to the board. Was it the board that signed off on her termination? Well, the board didn't have to sign off. It was within the authority of the, of the CEO. But the board was very much aware and there was no opposition to that plan from the, I presented to the board and the board were okay. I mean, there was no discussion related to anything negative. They were aware of the circumstances surrounding it. The what were the circumstances? Well, uh, Sharon and I had gotten along very well for about 10 years, maybe more. Uh, did a lot of good things, I think, for the corporation and moved forward and uh, something poison the atmosphere. I'm not quite sure what it is. I've been racking my brain for quite a while trying to put my finger on what might have been the issue or issues. But uh, uh, the morale because of that relationship uh, basically was deteriorating and very difficult to have a, an environment where the uh, CEO and the CFO were not functioning the way they should. So uh, I was paid to run the business so I made the call and uh, that's what happened. The minister said today that this uh, corporation the size of the NLC needs to have a CFO, but you're of the opinion that it could operate without, and, and that would be a 200000 roughly, yeah, dollar savings? Yeah, basically. I mean, it could operate with not without a CFO, per se, but the, C the role of the CFO 
uh, with the amount of accounting support that we've got on the cal caliber of the people in the organization, uh, uh, it wasn't necessary to have a CFO uh, sol wholly and solely, in, in my view. How did you find out that Sharon Sparks, a person you terminated a month earlier, was going to now take your role? I had a call from uh, the minister, as it happened, about four minutes after I left the Confederation building to tell me that uh, uh, I think he made some comment about how appreciated how easy I'd made all this, and then he told me that uh, the role was going to be filled on an interim basis by Sharon Sparks. How did you feel about that? I was shocked. Well, no, nothing more I could say. What about the appointment now of Lynn Sullivan as the CFO, a former Liberal candidate? Well, I don't know Lynn Sullivan. I mean, I've met her obviously in the last few days, but prior to that, I wouldn't have known her if she'd walked, walked off the street. But uh, <coughs> nothing against her personally, and uh, the whole thing with her arrival was something that may have precipitated some of the activity, I'm not sure, but I was very much against that in the in the meeting where it was brought to the board that uh, the shareholder wanted to bring uh, another person in as a CFO. I was adamantly opposed to it because I'd already made the recommendation to the chairman that uh, we uh, reduce the size, of the size of the executive, spread the responsibilities, and save the money. So there's no money saved now at this point? I suspect there's more money spent. Is this political? You were appointed by a conservative premier, Danny Williams, and now there's a liberal government in. Do you think it's political? Uh, it could well be, Fred, but I'm not, I'm not a political person. I'm a businessman, and I, I don't, whether Danny Williams put me there or Tommy Toe put me there, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, but I don't think it was done with any political motive. What about your dealings with the uh, canopy situation and the fact that the NLC has to implement this new procedure of, of, of governing the sale of cannabis? Uh, you know, the minister indicated that you weren't really entirely on board with this. How accurate is that? As far as this uh, cannabis is concerned, I was concerned that the focus would be on that and not on the, on the, the money making part of the business for the province. It may have had to be that way in order to get it done. At the end of the day, could you have continued with the way government was dealing with you? It was certainly getting tougher. I mean, I had to say that I'm relieved not to be there. Yeah, maybe. Can you give some examples of what was going on with government interference? Well, the biggest one, obviously, is uh, the CFO being dropped into the organization. I mean, that's uh, that to me is just uh, unheard of. And then, you know, now to have a, a terminated executive put back in in my place, that just tells you that there's all kinds of governance issues and uh, or either that or there was an overall plan in the first place to do it. Mr. Winter, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Well, today is the last day for Sears in the Avalon Mall in St. John's and with the chain closing across the country, more than 12,000 employees are out of work. But they're not the only ones affected by the company's bankruptcy. 18,000 pensioners are also taking a hit because Sears stopped paying insurance premiums. As Here Now's Megan McCabe reports, those retirees are facing a heavy blow. At 72, Ron Husk never thought he'd be doing this again, heading to work. After a career with Sears in St. John's, starting in 1965 at the old Simpson Sears downtown and retiring from the Village Mall store 35 years later, Husk thought he was set. He'd paid into a pension that would take care of him and his wife Florence for the rest of their lives. But he was wrong. I went to a funeral of a good friend there a few weeks ago, and it's pretty, it fills you up, you know, knowing that uh, going through things like this now, why should I have to do this? Husk would rather be home with his wife at this point, but with the pension plan underfunded by at least 20%, he saw the cuts coming. They canceled my life insurance, they discontinued my health and dental, and now in 2018 sometime, they're gonna cut my pension. That leaves me in a spot where, well, I, I'm gonna need more money to make ends meet. At my age, I'm 72 years old, I've gone to work, and I'm gone to work at part-time at the Home Depot, who I must say treats me very well, and I enjoy it there, and uh, I'll just have to stay there for a while. It wasn't always like this with Sears. Going through photos from his retirement party back in 2000, Husk says it was a wonderful place to work. When I was in the village mall, we had the big fountain downstairs and all the seniors would be down around it. 
we used to call him the Gerald Hall generation. <laughs> Carrying on with him, you know, we were great friends with him. And they used to come up and say, well, you're soon going to retire. Well, boy, you're going to look back and say it went so fast. And they're exactly right. Mm. It went fast. We all look back at our life. It's gone. That's it. But his appliance sales job was all commission, and it was stressful. So he was ready to retire, never dreaming the stress would follow him. When you're in your 70s, who wants to cut back on your finances? You try to live comfortable, you know, the rest of your life. What? I know, I guess you could say what you got left in this life. And it's sad when these companies do this. There's no protection. You think when you're retired, they say, well, you got no worry now. You're going to retire, live happily ever after. There's no such thing. In the couple's modest Mount Pearl home, Husk worries what's going to happen when he's not well enough to work anymore. Because it's expensive to live here, very expensive. The price of everything is going up, and now I even mentioned some people in the work I talked to them, what are you, you going to do when the electricity, they say, doubles? They say to me, I don't know what, what I'm going to do. And here's my income going to drop. And we're like, we're like everybody else, we live paycheck to paycheck. And now they're going to take part of it away. Megan McCabe, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Homes near a recycling depot in Bay Vert are still being evacuated this evening. The area filled with smoke early this afternoon after a major fire broke out in the building. RCMP officers spent much of the afternoon directing traffic away from the burning structure and told people nearby to leave their homes. Strong winds pushed the fire away from other buildings, but police say heavy smoke posed a risk to people. This was the scene last night at the Provincial Transportation Depot in Bellevue. Fire departments from four communities responded. No one was injured, but two pieces of snow clearing equipment were lost in the blaze. Firefighters faced high winds and snow squalls. They also had to deal with burning tires and fuel. And charges have been laid eight months after this fatal crash in St. John's. The 23-year-old man who was driving is facing a charge of dangerous driving causing death. The Corvette was traveling back from Cape Spear last May when it went off Blackhead Road and ended up on its roof. A 27-year-old passenger who was thrown from the vehicle died two days later. The 23-year-old who was charged was seriously injured. Well, a terrifying crash sent a man and a pickup over a guardrail and into icy St. John's Harbor. It happened just after midnight on the west end of Harbor Drive. And as you can see, the truck flipped over, tumbled through the air and into the water. The driver is okay. Police say he kicked out the front window to escape. But the truck is now completely underwater. After four days of cancellations, Marine Atlantic Ferries were back in action today with an extra vessel in the water to help ease congestion at its ports. Crossings in the Cabot Strait have been cancelled since Thursday morning because of all that bad weather. And that left about 200 commercial vehicles and between 150 and 200 passengers waiting stuck in Port of Basque and North Sydney. All scheduled sailings for today were expected to go ahead and a third boat... The Atlantic Vision left North City this morning. Marine Atlantic expects to clear up that backlog tonight. All right, well, let's bring somebody in for his first work for, uh, weather forecast for 2018, right? Yes. We haven't seen you in ages. Welcome I back. Know. Welcome I back. I recognize you. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to be back uh, again. A little a few butterflies going in the stomach because oh, it's been yes. a while. I yep. hope I can remember how to do this. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> For you, it's like riding a bike. Yeah, I <laughs> hope so. Um, and again, we've got, uh, it was we just mentioned, Marine Atlantic all tied up. It's been a pretty blustery weekend. Poor yep. Carolyn Stokes, by the way. <laughs> I really left her to the wolves last week with all that stormy weather. So thanks to her uh, for, for backfilling. Uh, I want to show uh, first off the top here this great picture by Aidan Mahoney, which kind of, I think sets the scene for what the West Coast has been dealing with all weekend long. And you can see where we've got uh, Corner Brook here uh, and lots of snowblowers on the go over the last uh, couple of days along the, uh, the West Coast. The onshore flurries, they've been easing just over the last couple of hours. And you can see where they're starting to continue to taper off there. Radar shows that uh, snow squall that was persistent across the Avalon for most of the afternoon uh, starting to ease off there as well. The snow squall watches and warnings have ended. And as we take a look at the future tracker here, it's actually going to be quiet for, oh, I don't know, 
four, five, six hours. And then as we roll through the overnight hours, our next system builds in. So it's a pretty quiet, uh, brief break, uh, but uh, certainly by 6 a.m. that snow starting to work into the southwest parts of the island. St. John's will be start uh, quiet early on. The snow will start to roll in around the 8, 9 a.m. time period with a few flurries. Steadiest snows will arrive towards the lunchtime hour for Metro and Corner Brook, central parts of Newfoundland into some of those steadier snow bands as well. For the Avalon and the Buren, this is a mix to some snow. I think we're closer to five centimeters, potential for up to 10 centimeters over sections of the Avalon, the Buren, and especially that southern part of the island along that south coast, two to five centimeters elsewhere. It's a pretty quiet Tuesday shaping up for Labrador. We'll break down your complete provincial forecast for the next couple of days in just a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. As members of NAEP get set to vote on a tentative agreement with the province, details of the deal are leaking out. Sources have told CBC News that the four-year agreement contains a wage freeze for the remainder of the contract. NAEP's been without a deal since March 2016. Now to soften that blow, there's a no layoff clause and the province is offering to pay out severance to all employees in this fiscal year to get that liability off its books. A website that posts obituaries from across Canada has infuriated grieving families in this province whose loved ones have appeared on the site without permission. The website is called Afterlife and it sells different products for people to express their levels of sympathy. But there are questions about just who's benefiting from this. Here now is Carolyn Stokes spoke with one grieving mother this afternoon. All of these are brand new. Brand new obituaries, brand new grief. People in this province who just died on display on the website Afterlife. This lady just passed. She's not even in the ground. Not just recent obituaries, Raylene Manning Puddister's son, Tyler, died five years ago, but her grief is still fresh. As I open my eyes right away, my first thought is, okay, another day I have to get through. The obituary she wrote for her son in 2012 was copied from the funeral home's website and posted on Afterlife. She heard about the website from a CBC story and decided to check. I went into the site and up popped my beautiful son at the age of 22 and uh, it flattened me. It took me about five minutes to catch my breath, in fact. Um, and then I cried for about two hours in just disbelief complete disbelief that someone would take my son's obituary, which was brutal to write, and take it and, 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 and use it for a, to feed their pockets somehow. I received nothing in return from them. Their eternal candles, these, all this foolishness that they have on the site. So those virtual candles she just mentioned, well, they can be bought for various prices. One day for $3, $30 for eternity. So we're going to buy the cheapest option to see what it looks like. The website says the candle will be of great comfort and healing for you and those who view the obituary. But Puttister doesn't find comfort, only questions. I have to go into that site to watch a candle burn for an hour? That's costing someone $5? Where did that $5 go? A spokesperson for the site says all they do is group obituaries into one database that allows people to send condolences and flowers easily. In a written statement to CBC Calgary, the spokesperson writes, there is nothing underhanded about our company. Any information that is openly shared online is public information. Puttister emailed Afterlife and asked for her son's obituary to be removed, and hours later it was, but her anger remains. Our children are gone, we're trying to survive, and you are using our grief to make money. It's, it's absolutely disturbing and highly disgusting. Puttister says she'd like to see enough public outrage to shut down Afterlife completely. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Putting questions to Hydro about their ask for a hefty rate increase. The consumer advocate is not convinced. There is no justification for any rate increase at this time. That's just ahead.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The province's consumer advocate is trying to delay Hydro's general rate application, which is scheduled for the end of this month. Among other things, the utility is looking for a 23% increase in electricity rates for households on the island by this time next year. Dennis Brown has raised numerous concerns with the Public Utilities Board. We spoke this afternoon. So Dennis Brown, what do you make of Hydro's intent to ask for a 23% hike in electricity rates for homeowners here on the island? Well, Hydro can't justify that rate increase at this time. We've been looking for information from Hydro as to where they're coming up with the 23%. They can't give us that information. So if they can't give it to us, they can't give it to the Public Utilities Board. So what are we doing here? It's time Hydro gave specific answers to questions in reference to what kind of increase, if any, that they're seeking. So how is Hydro justifying this ask? Well, there's no justification for it. That's why we've gone to the board to request a delay. We're looking for more reports. We're looking for more evidence because they can't justify 23% at this time. It seems to us that the, what they want to do is have an increase at this time to bump up rates in preparation for Muskrat Falls so people won't have a huge bump up. But there's no regulatory principle for that. So what do you think is behind this? Well, it appears that they want to increase rates now, to bump them up now, so they'll be able to squirrel away money for some kind of deferral account once Muskrat Falls comes on stream. Then they'll be able to use the proceeds from that deferral account to uh, mitigate against people's rates. But it's all very nebulous. And uh, remember, once Muskrat Falls comes on stream, in the first year, we need $800 million. Now, from a, an economic perspective, the provincial treasury only takes in $1.6 billion in income tax. So keep that figure in mind, $800 million. Where is that to come from? It can't come from people's rates. People c couldn't afford electricity based on that. There are only 270,000 customers here on the island. So 800 million in one year. And it seems to us that they're trying to put a Band-Aid on a problem that requires a major operation. You called it nebulous, and you're talking about a Band-Aid solution here. What do you think is needed? What is needed is the entire post-Muskrat era, as we plan for it, should be put before the Public Utilities Board now. And uh, the figures should be brought out and into the open, a transparent process, something we haven't had in reference to Muskrat Falls yet, an open, transparent process. They should show we need 800 million let Newfoundland Power come forward with its experts, the industrial customers, like economists come forward. Let's figure out if there's a new regulatory regime we can develop here to deal with Muskrat Falls and the debt that we're all going to assume, and much of it will have to be dealt with in our, in our bills, in our electricity bills. We need a plan. What they're proposing is no plan at all. And how resistant do you think they're going to be to your application, and I gather other customers, uh, to what you want? Well, uh, we're hoping now that Newfoundland Power uh, will join us in the application. Uh, we're hoping that the industrial customers will join us. And uh, we, uh, the three interveners uh, will then make a, uh, a good show, a good case before the board to uh, deal with this problem. Um, it's time that all the confusion that's come out of Hydro and its affiliate companies to be addressed. Let's not cause more confusion by talking about deferral accounts, uh, by talking about uh, how much uh, we can help out by a mitigation plan. I don't see any plan in place. They have no plan. It seems these are words. But let's put it all before the board squarely and let's plan our future ourselves in a process that all citizens can take part in. Dennis Brown, thank you very much. Well, thank you. So is he shining a light, Dennis Brown, is on the issue as to whether or not a generation of people in Newfoundland Labrador should pay for electricity rates 
that people in the future are going well, to pay? That's exactly that's what... That's the nebulous it, part? It, yeah, and uh, that's what he is pointing out. And he said there's no uh, precedent for doing this kind of mm -hmm. thing, no regulatory regime, as he puts it. So, so it, he's still looking for more information from Hydro, and I guess we will keep an eye on yeah. this. Stay tuned. Well, everybody seems sick with a cold, <laughs> but does, <laughs> does anyone know what to take for it? Welcome back. Now, before we get to the weather with Ryan, we do have something that's sort of weather related. It's a pretty cool video for you to see. Yeah, it's a Boeing brand new aircraft, the Dreamliner, performing training flights over Gander. Just take a look. There it goes. Oh, my. Woo. Yeah, you think that's a crosswind? <laughs> it looks like it's taking off sideways because it pretty much is. This is Boeing's uh, 787-10 Dreamliner. As Debbie mentioned, it was uh, in Gander for testing Friday and Saturday. And the pilots are gauging how the plane performs when it's taking off or landing in those crosswinds that Ryan was talking about, not to mention the tailwinds. And why, you ask, would they pick Gander and Newfoundland? <laughs> <laughs> we have had lots of windy conditions, so obviously that's why they've picked Gander. Yeah. And uh, kudos to the pilots who 
do those test flights. And I had a hard time keeping my shovel straight in the driveway yesterday and uh, on the weekend. I can't imagine aircraft. <laughs> yeah. And a big shout out to uh, 235 uh, Firefly uh, who posted that video on uh, oh, YouTube nice. and uh, gave us the, uh, the thumbs up to, uh, to uh, show that to you. So some great video there. Wind, yeah, definitely the issue uh, through the weekend for Marine Atlantic, good for planes, if you're testing them, uh, good for not so good for Marine Atlantic and the winds are going to continue to subside through tonight good. and not too bad through tomorrow, but then picking up again on Wednesday. So let's get into your weather forecast. Uh, you think they're tired of shoveling on the West Coast? <laughs> <laughs> Even at 21 months old, Claire has had enough. And uh, poor Claire, because it's only early January. There's a lot more snow to go, Claire. And thanks to uh, uh, the uh, Alexander family for uh, sharing this picture with us from Stephenville Crossing. Yeah, it was a pretty nasty old weekend along the West Coast. Those onshore flurries continuing to ease over the next couple of hours. Same thing across the Avalon, where there was a couple of pretty pesky snow squalls, mainly south of Metro, uh, but those are continuing to taper off through the uh, next couple of hours as well. It's a quiet evening into the overnight, but our next system, it's already knocking on the door. It's building snow into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia at this hour. It pushes into our neck of the woods before morning. So note those winds. These are gusts in kilometers per hour, and you can see they're easing slowly but surely through the next couple of hours and not too bad to start the day as that snow will push in from southwest to northeast. I think the snow is certainly underway for Port of Basque by tomorrow morning. Cornerbrook, it's mainly cloudy skies central towards St. John's to start the day. Minus 31 in Labrador City, minus 22 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So certainly a chilly start. Watch your timeline here. The snow will continue to push in from southwest to northeast. Definitely the heaviest snowfall for the metro region will be closer to the lunchtime hour and through those early afternoon hours just before the change over to some light rain and drizzle, which will happen likely through that late afternoon and into the supper time hour. That snow will continue for Cornerbrook towards central parts of Newfoundland. And uh, we are talking about temperatures rising to two or three degrees on the plus side for the Buren and the Avalon, while we'll be minus two to minus three for central back towards western parts of the island. Pretty quiet day, uh, some late day flurries up towards the Straits in St. Anthony. Uh, chance of a flurry, Happy Valley Goose Bay back towards Labrador City with light winds there. Now, in terms of snowfall over the next 24 hours, this is what we're looking at. As I mentioned, it's going to be that mix to drizzle for the Buren and the Avalon. I think we're closer to five centimeters for Metro, but certainly could get into that 10 centimeter range if uh, some of those steadier bands do work through. Uh, back across the south coast will be the best chance of getting closer to those 10 centimeter amounts. Uh, Cornerbrook and uh, not out of the question there either. And looking at for the northwest half of the island, generally two to as much as five centimeters. Now, we will see some additional snowfall, a trace to another centimeter or two for Tuesday night in through Wednesday. And as I mentioned to Debbie and Anthony, those winds are going to pick up on Wednesday. Back from the northwest, back in those 60, 70, even 80 kilometer per hour gusts. So that's going to be a cool day, not just temperature wise, but wind chill values on Wednesday are going to be wicked into the minus teens, even 20s across the island. It's going to be a real chilly one in Labrador. Again, minus 18 to minus 25 for highs with wind chill values into the minus 20s and 30s there. Now a look into the Thursday time period shows that winds are going to remain uh, steady and then ease as we roll into the day on Thursday. That is on the leading edge of our next system, which does have rain and a lot of warmth with it. We're talking about a big warm up for Friday and into the weekend. And we'll talk all about that with your long range in just a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. So how are you feeling these days? A little sniffly, stuffed up perhaps? It seems that this time of year, almost everyone has a cold. And if you don't have it, someone in your house, office or classroom does. So what can you to do and take to feel better in a hurry? Is one medicine as good as the next? Here now, Zach Gowdy has already been stricken with a cold and he went in search of advice and relief. Okay, Keith, I'm sick. Everybody's sick, seemingly. So what can I buy in here to feel better and fast? Zach, it's too bad that you're sick, but it seems like at <laughs> this time of the year, uh, most of Newfoundland is. It's uh, probably a product of um, the Christmas season. People probably eating too much and maybe drinking too much and not resting enough. So I call it kind of the, partly the Christmas cold. So there's a lot to choose from, Keith. What's the best strategy for shopping for cold medications? Best strategy is know your symptoms 
and talk to your pharmacist or your doctor about what you particularly need. All right, well, let's get into it. I am congested, so what ingredients should I be looking for and, and, and what are they actually doing, Keith? This is a very common one that's available in most pharmacies. So if you look at it, we have acetaminophen, which helps for pain and aches. Uh, we have dextromethorphan, which is a cough suppressant. That's found in most of the products that will be labeled for cough. Uh, there's something called phenylephrine in this product, which is for nasal congestion. So there's that one, and there's another one called pseudoephedrine, which is very similar. You'll find that in most of the products for runny nose. And this one actually adds an antihistamine, an allergy medication called chlorpheniramine. That helps kind of dry up your sinuses and also helps you sleep. So if my biggest problem is if I have a headache from my sinus congestion, should I be trying to get like the most acetaminophen I can per package? Not necessarily because you need, you need to dose that safely throughout the day as well. We run into most problems with people who have medical problems and they blindly sort of take something or take something from a friend that actually affects their medical conditions and puts them, makes them worse than they would be otherwise just to treat sort of a basic cold. Uh, I'll just grab a couple of the Benlins here, which are a commonly used agent, and I'll give you an example of how confusing it can be for people. They look very similar, um, the labeling is very small, but each one does a different thing. So the, the orange one here is just for dry cough. It has that drug dextromethorphan, just cough alone. This one here actually combines another agent that helps dry up your sinuses and loosen chest congestion. So if someone were to take this, who couldn't take it because of high blood pressure, there would be a risk. So consumers have to be very careful. And how about the prevention products, like the cold FXs and the other things mm. of this nature? How much value is there in that? <sighs> Not a lot of evidence to support it. Some people swear by it, as you know, uh, but the evidence is mixed on, on preventative therapy. Well, you, you talked about an ounce of prevention at the beginning of the interview. I, I know I should have done things differently over Christmas, <laughs> but now that I'm already sick, are there things that I can do in conjunction with what I'm going to take well, to Zach, feel better? I think for you, we need to do a couple things here. <laughs> you need to rest. Oh, that's a hard challenge. <laughs> Drink lots of fluids. Stay away from other people that are sick if you can. Mm -hmm. Good advice. And if you do have to cough or sneeze, where are you going to sneeze? All right. Well, I've exactly. done that story before. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I really regret borrowing Zach's sweater, so, uh, <laughs> as oh, if yeah. it would fit. <laughs> Poor Zach. Anyway, how about chicken soup? That's the best cure. All right, homemade. <laughs> I'm Colleen Connors at Marble Mountain today, and I'll tell you why the frigid temperatures are actually a good thing for skiers and snowboarders.
He's an ordinary guy with a high-end habit. Vernon Smith, the collector of classic cars. If it's not original, it's not here. <laughs> Sunday at 12.30 and Monday at 7. Well, after a week of delays, some great news for skiers. Marble Mountain finally launched its ski season over the weekend, but the entire hill isn't open just yet. Here now is Colleen Connor stopped by Marble to see how things are working out. Even on a Monday, people are hitting the slopes. The hill officially opened to the public Sunday. Yeah, it was great to hear uh, all the hoots and hollers and so many people shouting from the chairlifts. Uh, in the lodge, we had, again, a ton of smiling faces. Uh, we actually had some entertainment in here as well, so people were really able to take in the full atmosphere. Staff had hoped for a lively January 1st opening, but the high winds and nasty storms disrupted snowmaking, leaving slopes bare in sections. Today is a different story. Conditions are freshly groomed today. We do have a little bit of fresh snow uh, that arrived overnight, so about five, maybe 10 centimeters in some windblown areas. Uh, grooming is spectacular. I was out already today and uh, had a lot of fun on the slopes. This place is perfect for skiers like Tom Kennedy. Um, it was windy in places and powdery and then icy in, in the space of about two seconds. <laughs> the skiers don't mind the cold temperatures. It's about minus 20 with the wind chill. Exactly what this hill needs right now. And our outdoor operations crew are working hard to make the mountains safe uh, uh, for skiing and riding. So having our snow making in this type of temperature, uh, it's producing ideal snow right now. And uh, we're going to be plugging hard this week to really get it up to where we need to be to open the rest of the mountain. The colder the better for the artificial white stuff to get the full hill covered by Friday. Well, the operators here at Marble Mountain are going to spend all this week making as much man-made snow as they can in preparation for their busiest days on the weekends. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Marble Mountain. Something, eh? Too windy to make snow? <laughs> Seems counterintuitive. <laughs> it is great that they're finally open. Uh, I'm yeah. sure that's uh, appealing to many people, but Absolutely. they still have challenges. Mm -hmm. These are the gannets of Bird Rock at Cape St. Mary's. Why this colony appears to be in trouble.
is time to introduce our young athlete of the day. This is Liam Wall from St. John's, six years old, and loves to play baseball with St. John's Minor Baseball. And the season is over, of course, because of the winter, uh, but Liam can't wait to start up again in the spring. Way to go, Liam. You're today's young athlete of the day. Remember that feeling uh, of warmth? I was just <laughs> going to say. Spring. Yeah. You know what, though? Um, well, first, we got to, before I was going to get right to the weather, I'm always eager yes. to get there, but we've, of course, got to talk about this first. Okay. So this is Bird Rock in Cape St. Mary's, home to 20,000 northern gannets, and each year they return to the same nest with the same partner, they're very loyal, of course, and they come back to try to raise their young. This video was recorded for the nature of things with David Suzuki and just came to our attention. These beautiful birds are quite impressive, as you no doubt agree, but they're also in trouble. Researchers say in recent years the adults have been abandoning their chicks at an alarming rate, and leaving them without food, but no one really knows why. It's a sad tale there for sure. Mm. We'll have to make a mad dash Such an impressive place to yeah, uh, check it out of the number of birds, but climate change possibly, the pursuit of food. Definitely. Who knows, not the expert. Yeah, yeah, well, that'll be an interesting show for sure. Mm. Back to that warmth. Mm -hmm. We saw the baseball pick. Uh, we're talking about warm air in the long range. That's going to be the big theme this week is how warm is it going to get and uh, how much freezing rain are we going to see this weekend? couple of things to watch. Uh, I want to show you the map across North America and I'll direct your attention to the West Coast. LA at 18 degrees, Phoenix at 23. Don't get excited. We're not going to get that warm. But the system that is rolling onto the West Coast right now, you can see the big trough of low pressure there and there is that low. That is going to be basically our weather maker that moves across the continent this week and will bring us that eventual warm push for Friday, another system will follow it up through the weekend and bring an additional warm push for Newfoundland Saturday night and in through Sunday. And here is uh, how it's all going to play out. First, our weather maker that's moving in as we speak. It's got snow already crossing the Maritimes. It moves in tonight and in through tomorrow. Generally 5 to 10 centimeters for the southern half of the island. I think we'll be closer to 5 for Metro. We are looking at a mix to some light rain and drizzle into the late afternoon and evening hours, just in time for the drive home and just enough to make that snow a little bit heavier to shovel, though there won't be a ton of it. Now, as we talk about your future tracker, note the squalls that end tonight. It's a quiet start to the day across uh, most of the Newfoundland, but the south coast already into some of that snow. It does increase into the afternoon with some of those steadier snow bands. There's the mix for the Avalon and Buren. That low is a pretty quick mover, but it does wrap some snow back in for Tuesday night in through Wednesday. And the big theme for Wednesday will be those chilly northwesterly winds. Onshore flurries back on the menu for you folks along the west coast, which uh, feels like I'm sure you haven't stopped shoveling in weeks. Now, as we uh, take a look at the Wednesday time period into Thursday, a brief break for those uh, onshore flurries and then our next system will start to roll in later Thursday into Friday. Note the track of this system so far west that it's going to be moving up into Labrador. Big southerly push of air here. This looks like on Friday into Friday night almost all rain for the island. No mixing. It's as we move into the Saturday time period, cold air pushes back in, a high builds into Labrador, and this is where we really get uh, a tricky setup with the cold air in place at the surface and our next system moving in. Freezing rain potential here across the island, especially central western parts of Newfoundland for Saturday night in through early Sunday. It does look like that warm secondary warm push will come through and so your eyes are not fooling you. Uh, there's a lot of warm temperatures in that seven day forecast, especially for January. Now, uh, could even be warmer than what we're talking about there for Saturday, Sunday, especially for eastern parts of Newfoundland. Lots of freezing rain potential, mainly for Saturday, uh, but uh, keeping an eye on that one, obviously, over the next couple of days. And for Labrador, Riding the cold side of these next couple of systems for sure, and deep cold, especially the Saturday, Sunday time period. We'll keep you posted on this over the next couple of days. Debbie. Thanks again, Ryan. In national and international news, police continued the search today for human remains at the scene of yesterday's fatal house fire in Nova Scotia. Four people were killed. That includes at least two small children. 
Police are not releasing the identities of the victims, but fire officials say the remains of at least some of them are still in the house. They say the flames had already engulfed the home when firefighters arrived Sunday. It happened in a small Acadian community in the southwestern part of the province. In the meantime, four people, including two children, have died in a rooming house fire in Oshawa, Ontario. We encountered heavy smoke, heavy fire conditions on scene. Um, our initial attack had to be from the outside because of the heavy fire conditions. The Oshawa Fire Service says multiple people were trapped in the two-unit residence as they tried to put out the flames. Officials have not released the identities or the relationship between the victims. Three other residents were taken to hospital with unknown injuries. Registration open today for free Loblaws $25 gift vouchers. They are the company's attempt to make it up to customers after coming forward to confess to years of price fixing certain brands of bread. As Scott Peterson reports, to get one of the vouchers, you have to sign up on the Loblaws website. Registration for the voucher means that you must supply your name, your address, be at least 18 years old and confirm that somewhere between the end of 2001 and March 2015 that you actually bought bread from George Weston Law Blog Group of Companies. The offer is a response to their admitted involvement in manipulating the price of bread which has triggered class action lawsuits. Anyone going to register at the Law Blog site can also participate in those class action lawsuits if they choose to listed on the website. And there's been a lot of interest on social media urging Canadians to accept the payment and then donate it to local food banks or charities, and that could add up. Loblaws estimates that up to 6 million Canadians might sign up for the voucher with a price tag to the company of $150 million. And if you are a food bank or a charity, that's a lot of bread. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. Lots of parents take pictures of their children on their first day of school, and royalty is no exception. The Duchess of Cambridge snapped these photos of Princess Charlotte about to head off to nursery school for the first time. The pictures were taken at Kensington Palace. Charlotte, who looks very sweet there, she's three this coming May. She'll be a full-time student at the school. It's near the palace and costs about $5,000 a term. Well, this one's a bit of a gimme for uh, <laughs> the first one back for me anyway of the new year. And but what a picture. That's gorgeous. We'll have another look at it and uh, you really should get it. <laughs> yeah. I think I think, I think we we're going to get this we, one. We'll reveal after the break. <laughs> yeah. It's gorgeous.
Welcome back. Uh, something to make you feel good as we wind down the show. Social media is certainly embracing this latest update from the web quadruplets in Alberta. Check this out. Get this. This video has raked in more than 55 million views on Facebook over the last week. And these little girls are Emily, Michaela, Abigail, and Grace, and they're not quite two. No, and it's quite the hugathon. And if you keep watching, <laughs> they just revolve from partner to partner, which I guess when you've got four, not so hard to do. So Spread one hug the wealth. <laughs> yep. And their mom says, here they go. She caught this epic hug fest after the toddlers watched uh, Moana. And uh, there you go, their most popular video up to date, she says. And uh, with all the negativity in the world, she says it's nice to see something happy and cute and loving. And 55 million people. <laughs> Got to share with that. Great. Yes, sweet. It's like one of our story meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll post that and see how many views yeah, we get. Right. <laughs> I'm doubting a lot less than 55 million. Uh, so, if you didn't get this, uh, I mean, perhaps uh, if you're not, I should say, if you're not from St. John's and you didn't get this, uh, well then... Uh, you're moving. You're, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, perhaps if you're not from town, then uh, this might not be one you would, uh, you would recognize, but a beautiful shot from Kitty Vitty, of course. Uh, and taken back towards St. John's with the fireworks happening there and Ray Mackey photography, great, great picture. Beautiful. The color really uh, makes it stand out, doesn't it? I love that the fireworks in the background too, all the yeah. backyard fireworks going yeah. on underway oh, at the yes. same time. I yeah. can see that now that you have drawn my attention to it, the left hand side there. Yeah, and even back to uh, off, of the, to the right, off yeah. of the distance there. It's uh, amazing what you can catch with these smartphones these days. So. <laughs> yeah, that was probably taken with a, with a smartphone, right? <laughs> That's gorgeous. Worth the effort. Definitely, yeah. I, I mean, he would have had to uh, hike up there at uh, that hour of the day. So, uh, Ray, great shots. Yep, a beauty. Keep them coming, and there's where you can send them. That's right, and there are so many great pictures that got posted uh, to my page over the Christmas break. Uh, shared some of them with you tonight, and uh, of course, more to come. 2018. Anyway, nice to see you, Ryan, Thank and you. Uh, thanks for being with us on this Monday evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night. See you then.